uh, with partner NCHV, uh, National Coalition of Homeless Veterans. Uh, today is Saturday, July 18, uh, 2020. Uh, we actually have uh, panelists who are calling in, Catherine Monet, and also uh, she's the Chief Executive Officer of the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans, and Ralph Cooper, uh, Community and Residential Veteran Services Coordinator at Cloudbreak uh, Houston, LLC, and co-founder of the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. However, we have uh, one person on the line who uh, actually is saving my life every time I meet with him. That's a uh, Cliff Kelly, he is uh, recovering from a mi minor medical uh, can issue. And uh, Cliff, we are, are so missing you uh, here <laughs> at the studio. And I'm sitting in this uh, the seat made for a giant icon, and that's you. <laughs> you folks are just great. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay, very clearly. <laughs> great, 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 great. No, you folks are wonderful. You really are. You've done doing some great work there. Uh, first part was, was just... Uh, Nothing short of excellent. You uh, filled in everything that needed to be done, and I just think, you know, you folks, uh, great. I'm hoping to be um, okay in the next uh, couple of days. I should be anyway. That's what they're telling me. So, yes. you folks, you folks, keep keep pushing for me, okay? Oh, we will, because you are okay. You are on. Great. You are on the uh, radar of everyone here, and we, uh, I'm, you know. Because I think I think uh, I owe you a dinner, so you uh, <laughs> better get that <laughs> before I run out of money. I, I like that. See, that's why that's why you you agree. You keep you okay. keep your commitments. You know. Okay. And yeah. Uh, okay, so we'll go uh, back to it. it's uh, America's Heroes Group Roundtable with partner V. Uh, NCHV, National Coalition of Homeless Veterans, and I already introduced Catherine Monet and Ralph Cooper, who are on the line. So we're going to be talking about testing COVID-19 homeless veterans. And uh, welcome to the show, Catherine and Ralph, and uh, we are really happy to have you here. This is a very important topic. Uh, maybe, uh, Catherine, can you uh, lead us off and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the organization and what, why you're so concerned about COVID-19? Yeah. We're making up uh, real bad. Hmm? Yeah, there's a some interference there. Um, oh, yeah. Can, can, yeah. Yeah. Can, can you all hear each other? Yes, you can. I can hear Catherine. Catherine, okay. can you hear me? And so Ralph, I can yes. hear you, Mr. Kelly. Um, Clyde, I can kind of hear you. I think you said to tell everyone a little bit more about NCHV. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think uh, we've got it. A bad connection, and I wanted all uh, this information to get out. All right, why don't you just take over that, uh, Colonel? Okay. Oh no, you're doing fine. Yeah, yes. Uh, so, yeah, let's tell us a little bit more about uh, CHV and mm -hmm. why you're so concerned about testing in homeless veterans. You sound so far away, Colonel. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me now? It's coming a little bit better, but you can read a little more clear. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so maybe you can tell us about NCHV and why testing uh, co for COVID-19 among homeless mm -hmm. veterans is so important for us to pay attention to. Okay. Well, NCHV has been around for 30 years, and we've been fighting for, you know, the needs of veterans who are experiencing homelessness, whether it comes to you know, accessing housing, accessing yes. employment, accessing any of the other benefits and services that they might need to, you know, stabilize in permanent housing. One of the things that's really important in this pandemic is to make sure that they're getting access to safety, right? Because when you're homeless, it's really hard to, you know, isolate. It's really hard to get to medical care when transportation may be a barrier. And so one of the things that we're concerned about is ensuring that, they have access to testing from VA, whether it's in a shelter setting or in permanent supportive housing where they might be living, or even if they're unsheltered and out, you know, in the streets. Yeah. So how, how is that paid for? Is, is it covered by the VA? Is that a benefit for our veterans? Because if they're homeless, um, many of them have issues with, um, uh, you know, uh, with uh, being unemployed or having uh, mental health issues, such uh, those kinds of things going on in the background. So how is this covered and how do they present uh, to get tested? Well, um, I can speak a little bit to that. 
Um, we have a, a 500 uh, unit uh, facility in Houston, Texas, uh, and part of that uh, group is uh, uh, people who are still not still transitioning from the street into into housing, and they're in uh, transitional housing. Mm-hmm. And um, the the VA is not um, testing our folks. We have to engage a private contractor who, for, in some cases, are paid through the CARES Act. So this new mm-hmm. CARES Act, for those who um, uh, can't access uh, health care through the, and get tested through the VA, I have to get tested elsewhere. A lot of these companies are operating under the CARES Act. That's one way those tests are being paid for. Okay. So does a, can a person have to does they have to go to a VA facility or can, can they go to a uh, you know a regular private hospital? Uh, what type of facility do they have to go to if they want to get tested? Well, um, of course the. The VA right now under the COVID is very, it's, it's a very troublesome process oh, to okay. to go to a VA. Uh, most of the VA services now are being done via teleconferencing, so you mm-hmm. it's hard to get tested that way. Um, mm-hmm. However, the emergency unit is open, and that is one way. That uh, if they're VA eligible, then you know they can utilize that. But a lot of the veterans that are on the street aren't VA eligible and can't utilize the VA. Oh, boy! So, so they really need to find some other alternative source uh, for testing. So we need That's to actually have another mechanism in place for them, right? Yes. I mean, I think another mechanism or just having VA do it. I think one of the frustrations that we've heard from our members across the country is that, you know, when you've seen one VA, you've seen only one VA, and there's not a lot of uniformity with regard to Mm -hmm. the decisions that it seems like medical centers are making about testing, particularly in the settings where you would find homeless veterans. Now, for those who are in places where VA has been out to the shelters testing, it doesn't seem like there has been a lot of retesting, mm-hmm. and it also seems like they are limiting their testing only to VA-eligible veterans, which means, you know, if you're a veteran in a shelter that maybe has 10 beds for veterans and 30 beds for civilians, you're only testing the 10, which means that they still could be at risk if the shelter can't find someone to test the other 30, or right, if the right. staff at the shelter aren't veterans. You know, they're not testing the staff, and the staff are coming in and out. So, I mean, we would hate to see a scenario where homeless shelters turn into the next, you know, state nursing home where you've got outbreaks because people are coming in and out. Yeah, you know, because that that brings up another point. So if the person uh, does test positive, then what's the recourse at that point for a veteran, you know, who's homeless? Because are they hospitalized, or how, how are they taken care of at that point? Um, and, and especially if they are asymptomatic or don't have the criteria for hospitalization, or even if they do, how do, how do we approach uh, veterans at that point, or how should they be approached? Well, there are kind of two scenarios I think uh, Catherine can address. The, the one around those veterans who are not already housed. But if they're already housed, uh, there are two methods that I know at the facility where I am. Uh, U.S. Vets has a, a, a deal with the, um, with the hotels where if a, if a veteran in their program gets tested and is found to be, um, found to have the disease, mm-hmm. then he can be isolated and, uh, and quarantine in a hotel unit. Okay. Um, and the, on the, the, the site where we have individuals who have the, uh, that are 
housed independently, we have a number of units that are set aside for those veterans who may um, come up positive and can be quarantined for, uh, in a unit apart from and separate from the rest of the population. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that, that's uh, really important. And if they do become hospitalized, then um, th I guess they have to go, if they don't have insurance or those kinds of issues, then there is a process I guess they have to go through uh, regarding uh, coverage, you know, uh, whether it's uh, through a county <coughs> system or through the VA itself, um, that, that probably will come into play. So, so uh, what are you seeing now? Uh, what, what are you seeing a, a number, a great number of veterans who are uh, testing positive, or what's been the experience of this so far? So, well, this is interesting. Oh, well, go ahead, Mr. Cooper. No, I'm, I wasn't sure. Go ahead, Catherine. It's okay. <laughs> That's an interesting question because it's been very difficult, I think, to get information from VA on the number of veterans who have been tested and tested positive who are homeless. Um, I think the last, well, the first information we got, the only information we got was about a month ago, and it seemed like there were around 400, I think they said 450 or so veterans who had tested positive of the, I believe, 10,000 veterans that they had tested who were homeless. Uh. And, you know, do, uh, and, and when you're looking at homeless veterans, because I know you're very uh, close to this issue, what what is the age breakdown? Because one of the things that uh, is really noted with COVID-19 <coughs> is that uh, people, uh, for example, in Illinois State, um, about 93% of the deaths have occurred in people 50 years old or older. But we've had some recent wars, of course, you know, with, um, you know, Afghanistan, with Iraq. And, and so, you know, our veterans, what is their age distribution and who's really at risk when we look at a population base? You know, because the worst consequence you can have, of course, from COVID-19 uh, is death, of course. And, um, you know, there are some other um, underlying medical conditions as you get older, if you do develop high, high blood pressure, diabetes and such, uh, you actually um, uh, get this, um, you get this, uh, care, you know, this uh, position where those people actually will uh, develop, um, you know, more severe disease. So um, I, I'm not sure if there's an age breakdown of, of veterans. And then we're going to go to a call as soon as you answer that. Hello. Hello. Oh no, I'm sorry. We're here. I wasn't sure if Mr. Cooper was going to get that or not. I, I'm happy to share. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think I think Dr. Arnold was. Yeah, go right ahead. Oh. Well, so they tend to be older, right? I think what we're seeing is a large cohort of you know Vietnam era and then um, you know first Gulf War era veterans, and I think smaller cohorts of younger veterans. But those veterans tend to show up you know, homeless with their families, which mm -hmm. is uh, yes. an additional challenge. That is additional. Yes, yeah, that, that is most definitely. Uh, we have a caller, uh, Robert Burlington. We're going to go to you. Uh, he's going to talk about his experience Hello. being tested at the VA. Hello. Hi. Hello, Cliff and the panel. How y'all doing over there? I'm in Berlin, I'm in Berlin Iowa. And uh, Wednesday, I went to Iowa City to get up there to get some uh, knee up, uh, knee, uh you know, when well, well, I bad knee, they uh, took a video out of my knee. Uh, anyway, outside, they scanned you. I was 97. Mm -hmm. Inside, I was 97. Also, now, when they take your picture, they put you, I was thinking about they were taking my picture. They put me in front of a thing like a scanner. They told me the whole still to look at it. But they scanned the whole body. That's the way they tested me in the VA over here. I think it was right. I've been tested three times. Not tested, but I went in to get my uh, X-ray on the knees, and they jack you up there, you know. Now I think what the uh, what's your name again? Robert M. I, I'm, I'm Robert. Robert. I think yeah. though, what what they do do is take a scanner and check you check your uh, temperature. Uh, one of the symptoms uh, with the disease is that you, you end up with a high temperature, 
but 97 is is uh, is normal. So I don't think uh, it wasn't the test because the the test requires a swab to be going down your down your nose all the way touching near your throat. So yeah. you would know if you got tested. You sure would. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Robert, for that uh, insight. Uh, that's something that, uh, you know, we have to be really cognizant of what our veterans are personally experiencing as they're going through this. And so, you know, as we're looking at people who are, are, who are homeless or veterans, they have other needs as well, you know, food. Um, and as you were mentioning, um, Karen, uh, uh, you know, Catherine, that the uh, people who are there also have family members sometimes so they are living on the street as not just by themselves as a veteran but um, as a homeless veteran as a homeless family so what do you think we should be doing from the veteran standpoint and if they are you know um, if the spouse of a veteran they may be covered by the VA as well you know through TRICARE mm -hmm. or some other uh, some other uh, type of uh, coverage so what do you think we should be doing, Catherine, you know, to, to reach out to those families? Is there something, another mm -hmm. need? Well, so I feel like there are a couple of things, right? And I think the first thing is that I want to applaud some of the outreach workers who are still doing street outreach mm -hmm. in the middle of a pandemic and trying to collect or connect, I'm sorry, veterans and civilians to housing. I mean, I think in the immediate sense, if someone is unsheltered, we should be moving them as quickly as possible into some kind of isolated housing, whether that's, you know, a place like Mr. Cooper's working where it's permanent supportive housing, or if we don't have anything, moving them immediately into a hotel or motel setting where they can be safe, right, while we're also connecting them to healthcare at VA and other services that could help with you know, food benefits and mm -hmm. all of the other things that they would need while we're also working on housing for them and something more permanent because, you know, at the end of the day, these hotel and most motel placements are wonderful and that people can be safe in the middle of a pandemic, which seems to still be raging on, but they're not permanent, right? Like at some point, the hotel industry is going to come back, travel will be back, I assume, I don't know when, but, you know, we've got to figure out how we're going to find housing for all of these people. And I think last I heard, VA had something like 5,000 veterans in hotels and motels with the CARES funding that they got, which is really great and testament to the hard work of grantees across the country. Mm -hmm. Sure. 5,000 veterans in need of permanent housing that we don't want to exit back to homelessness. That's mm -hmm. certainly correct. Yeah. Yeah, Cliff, do you have anything you want to say about the, you know, because I know you were um, a Vietnam veteran, and you saw people coming back in, in many different situations. Um, Absolutely. People still in them uh, from, um, from mm -hmm. even from our Vietnam veteran heroes um, who are on the street. And um, it, it sounds, you know, somehow we have got to break this, uh, break into this cycle. It's unconscionable not to be testing uh, the homeless veterans because they serve this country. Uh, it's a simple swab that we have to give to them, uh, and I can't understand why we're not doing that. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Th this is just uh, unconscionable. <laughs> well, Doc, I don't know. You're, you're, you're totally correct on that. We've got to do it. There's no other way we have to do it. Yes. So we, we can find a way to do it, don't you think? Oh, yes. Yes. I, if we can uh, put someone landing on the moon, we can do something. There you go. We can land someone uh, in a homeless set site to, to test mm -hmm. someone. <laughs> so, like uh, that. that's, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, but, you know, one thing, too, is that we also are coming up to a season, and I'm, I've been you know, talking to the state really in depth and working on some projects with them for the COVID-19 response. But also, people need to get their uh, flu shots um, and, um, you know, it's before the fall season so I've been convincing them to move from October November time frame to August and the reason is that we don't want people going into the healthcare system uh, during a time frame when uh, with the flu when uh, we may have a secondary pandemic wave later in the fall and uh, our veterans need to be able to get their flu shots I get my flu shot every year at the VA uh, mm -hmm. you know here in Chicago 
And uh, so what about, you know, just the routine care for our veterans, the flu shots, the making sure that they uh, have the kinds of medications they need, they're getting the, the access to the health care that they need? Um, so, you know, Ralph, you can answer, you know, speak to that or, or Catherine. Yeah. A lot of our veterans um, are, are subject to the leadership, and they mm -hmm. don't believe, number one, that this is really a problem, just like a lot of amongst our population. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're skeptical. They think maybe if I get tested, I'll, I'll get the disease, or mm -hmm. they, they, they just don't believe that. Uh, I don't believe that there's such a thing as this pandemic. So education mm -hmm. is is critical, education. and and especially for those who are on the street, and and, and those who are uh, entering into uh, facilities like mine from the street. We need to spend a lot of time just educating them, getting nurses from the VA to come out and have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. If there's some video. Uh, information that we can be letting people know that this is real uh, and you know we try to utilize people who we know uh, and that they may know that have been tested positive and gotten sick from this mm -hmm. so we've been very fortunate in the facility that I have and we have about a 500 person residence see, that we have not had anyone to be technically hospitalized nor die mm -hmm. from this from this pandemic but that is not the case in most of texas okay and we're closing up you know we're coming up on time right now but one thing i want you to address really quickly is what about the issue surrounding masks for these homeless veterans because we keep talking about you know um you know uh, the different you know the importance of using masks and making sure that people have access to them um so that they can actually effectively social distance uh any thoughts on you know supplying masks or supplies that they need, hand sanitizers, those kinds of things? Well, on, on my facility, we have boxes of bandanas and masks, which the VA uh, has helped provide. Um, as far as the street, uh, giving out masks in the street, I'm, I'm not really um, familiar with that. Are you Catherine? Yeah, so, I mean, I think I am a fan of masks, right, and harm reduction and, you know, mm -hmm. taking as many precautions as possible. So sure. I think to the extent that VA can do that, they absolutely should be. I mean, I feel like I've heard that masks aren't as much of a challenge sometimes as some of your other sanitation supplies that, right. you know, shelters right. or permanent supportive housing operators might need to keep facilities disinfected. And so I think if there was anything that VA could do to, you know, even just supply some of these facilities at cost okay. <laughs> oh, yes. with disinfectant and, like, those types of supplies, I, yeah. I think that would be really helpful because I just keep mm -hmm. hearing from folks who are struggling with their supply chain and saying that their normal supplier, you know, okay. has a wait list and it's going to be a month, and so they're out trying to you know, buy the same supplies that the community is fighting for, too, and right. waiting in line at the grocery store, which right. is ridiculous. 